Welcome to Thursday Night Knives. I'm your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. And tonight we're going to be talking about my state of my collection. We're going to talk about innovators in folders. And uh, we'll, we'll do some current events, some, uh, some new things coming out in the knife world that uh, are interesting to me. And uh, of course, as I talk about my collection, you'll find that I go on at length uh, tonight because I got something in today that I'm very excited about. Um, please join the conversation, comment, and uh, let us know your thoughts. And uh, those thoughts will add fuel to this conversation. And we'll bring your thoughts up and put them on screen and we'll talk about them. So please engage. Engagement is what it's all about. That's what they say. So uh, let's dive right in, shall we? So uh, before we get started on the uh, new drops coming out and such, uh, knife news, if you will, uh, I just want to promote the interview that we just did that will be coming out on Sunday night's um, Knife Junkie podcast. It's an interview with Knife Center's David C. Anderson, and it was a great conversation. I've been, uh, I've been following him very closely since Knife Center started doing their, um, their own videos uh, for a while. Uh, they just kind of weren't present and you would see a, a little bit here and there. And then it seems like when David joined the operation, they really kicked their video uh, video stuff into high gear. And now he's uh, not only introducing new knives. Uh, well, he has a weekly show of new knives coming into the uh, coming into the knife center. And he stands there with a whole array of knives and his laptop and very off the cuff um, talks about each one of them what he likes about them. And then you can probably infer what he doesn't like about them. Uh, but what you get is a real honest take and a real enthusiast's take on the new knives that have come out this week. Um, David C. Anderson is uh, himself a true knife junkie. He used to write for the Truth About Knives blog, and that's where he uh, really broke into the knife world. And that's where he got to know um, a number of people like L.T. Wright, uh, and, um, well, and others. And, uh, he also makes knives. He decided at one point to turn his passion into, uh, part of his living and started designing outdoor knives. He's an outdoorsy guy, has, uh, uh did the Boy Scouts, spent a lot of time outside, started designing these, uh, outdoor knives, uh, four of them that he has out, uh, currently. And, uh, LT Wright, and his operation make them. So they're beautiful designs uh, made by a trusted maker. And uh, yeah, me too. Spirited Whiskey says he's a big fan of Knife Center. Um, they were my very first internet purchase. They were my very first uh, knife site, you know, that I frequented. This was in 1998. I remember the job I had because I felt like it was a no-show job. I felt like a gangster because I was sitting there in an office, uh, <laughs> hey, Edwin, good to see you. Uh, it, it's a great interview. I think you'll love it. Uh, but sitting there in that office with little to nothing to do at times, uh, I would go right to Knife Center online and start spending the money I was earning for doing nothing. And uh, I'm really glad the Knife Center was there for me when I needed them. And uh, well, I'm just psyched to talk to, uh, that I talked to him. It was great. Hey, big bore knife and gear. Right back at you, sir. So yeah, David C. Anderson, check it out uh, this weekend on Sunday, and uh, I think you'll enjoy it. Well, thank you, sir, uh, and have a good evening from Virginia. Uh, coming right here to you from Virginia, Barry Levitt says, good evening from Colorado. I'm interested in the Southern Grind Spider Monkey, but the Titanium Lock Bar does not have a steel insert. Is this a problem? Okay, well... I can't speak to the spider monkey in particular, um, but I haven't heard anything a and B I am of the, of the mindset that not every piece of titanium meeting every piece of steel needs that lock bar insert. Some makers just nail it. Like Chris Reeve nails it uh, right here. Emerson nailed it. And this is a titanium liner lock and uh, every Emerson I've had. Well, okay. Emerson is a special, uh, special case because every Emerson I've had has uh, had to go through a brutal break-in period where I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to return this, the lock stick, this, and the this, and then that. And then after 
after playing with it for a week or two, all of a sudden it's buttery smooth and awesome. So I would say don't let the fact that the spider monkey has a titanium uh, liner lock stop you from getting it. I, that's one that I've been thinking of lately, not the spider monkey, but the bad monkey, the bigger one. Uh, but I love that design, and I don't think you should let, let that stop you. If it is a problem, call me, and you can sell it to me. Spirited Whiskey, if lock face geometry and lock bar geometry are done correctly, you do not need a lock bar insert. I agree. I agree 100%. And uh, actually, sometimes when I see a lock bar insert, like when Hinderer went to the lock bar insert, I was like, huh, does that mean they're going to not be as precise in their machining? But, of course, it doesn't mean that. They were just keeping up with trends and, uh, you know, trying to make their knives as, uh, you know, as, as good as they can make them. Uh, I, I do believe that. Um, I was going to say something else and it just whoosh, evaporated. It was brilliant and deep, I assure you. But uh, in any case, uh, let's move on to the knife news and what's coming out. Now, I, I went to knifenews.com. That's my, uh, that, that and uh, knife magazine are my primary sources for, uh, new knife news and what's coming out, what to look forward to, or what to, um, what to be critical of, I'll be frank. Okay, so Benchmade has uh, uh, just announced that they're re-releasing the bug out and the bailout with upgrades. And uh, they're kind of interesting upgrades, I gotta say. Um, when I first saw it, I was like, uh-oh, it's the, uh, you know, they've, they've been hearing about the steel uh, in the, um, uh, the bailout, and they've been hearing feedback of people unhappy with how they heat treated that 3V, and they're changing it up. But they they kind of changed it up completely. But I'll start with the bug out. Uh, the bug out um, is now going to be, I think this is just a variation, by the way. I don't think they're changing them all to this. Uh, but it's the bug out three, uh, 535BK-2, BK standing for black, because this whole knife is black, including the thumb stud. And uh, it's S30B with a DLC coating, so nothing has changed on the blade, but the handle is different. They are using something they call CF Elite, Carbon Fiber Elite, and what it is, is or how it's described in this article, is a carbon fiber that is um, integrated throughout the um, throughout GRN, I guess, basically, and uh, yeah, so it's it. It's a fiber reinforced polymer. So you don't really see the traditional weave of the carbon fiber. When you look at the, the scale, you still see kind of a, a flat, um, you know, kind of uniform black surface. But within the material, um, it's, it's uh, held together very strongly with carbon fiber, not only going across, but going up and in all directions. And uh, it adds a tiny, tiny bit of weight, apparently. Um, but this is uh, an automotive and aerospace industry material, and it's supposed to add significantly to the rigidity of the handle. And that's always been a kind of a complaint from people or, or a speculation anyway from reviewers on YouTube when the, when the, um, when the Benchmade first came out. You're quite welcome, sir. Uh, when the Benchmade first came out, Everyone was saying, I don't know if this handle can handle me. I just use my knives so hard. This plastic is sure to break. Um, I, I went immediately for aftermarket uh, micarta scales, so I don't have too much experience with the original polymer. But, I mean, it's, it's not going to break unless you're being a fool with the knife. But I still, I still appreciate the fact that they were, A, listening to customers, and B, thinking of this knife, kind of taking the knife outside of its... Uh, um, original purview and, and adding some tacticalness or a little bit more robustness to it. It adds a tiny bit of weight, but I think, uh, in my opinion, overall, it's an improvement. Plus, I just love the bug out. I think it looks excellent. Yes, Big Bore Knife and Gear, their version of G10 on steroids. That's, that's kind of what it sounds like. It's, uh, you know, if I can't see the carbon fiber, you know, it's sort of the reverse of the Spyderco carbon fiber where they take G10 and put carbon fiber on the top. Uh, and you look at it and you say, oh, there's some carbon fiber. But really, you know, it's just a thin layer. Well, this almost seems like the reverse, though, as they claim, it's all throughout the polymer. So so it should strengthen it tensely and laterally and all that. Um, the other thing that they came out with is the um, 
uh, a rehashing or a, an updating of the bailout. And the bailout, of course, was the uh, uh, brother, the younger brother of the bug out kind of came a year afterward uh, once once the popularity of the bug out was gauged. They came out with the bailout, which is a slightly larger, slightly more tactical and tanto uh bug out family member, we'll call it. And uh, it it had the same grivery handles. Grivery? How do you pronounce that? It has the same grivery handles as the original uh, bug out. Um, and it had this 3V steel that everyone was super psyched about because 3V, which is, I, if I'm not mistaken, is normally used with more high impact outdoor camp knives that need excessive toughness. Um, so I think when they came out with the bailout with this super tough steel, people went crazy because it's not a um, it's not a steel that you find on folders frequently. Um, so it was a it was definitely a point of interest. But um, once the uh, some internet reviewers who are steel experts, they call them the HRC police now, uh, kind of unofficially. Um, got a hold of that knife and tested it, I guess they had some suspicions that maybe it, it wasn't heat treated the way they wanted it to be, or that it was softer than it should be. Uh, they, I, I feel like the bailout's popularity may have taken a dive there, but now they're coming back with it. It's in a way more rigid um, uh, aluminum frame. And I am a sucker for aluminum. I almost like it better than titanium, except titanium has a certain cachet that I like. Um, I love the way uh, aluminum feels. I love how light it is. It's you know much lighter than titanium even. And uh, I, I just I just love that material. So I think it's a great move to make the bailout in uh, uh, with aluminum handles. And then at the end of that protruding and somewhat uh, some people don't like it, the um, uh, the what do you call it? the lanyard hole at the end. it's a it's actually the backspacer that extends beyond the end of the handle and offers you a loop to put your lanyard through. Well, they just put a uh, carbide glass breaker on the end of that. So it's uh, kind of increasing the utility of the knife and kind of maybe even making it more of a tactical selection than maybe an EDC. Um, so they're kind of really owning the tacticalness of this. And, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, whatchamacallit, the aluminum, great choice. But the big news is that they swapped out the 3V for, you know, with the super toughness for M4, which is also a semi stainless steel. And uh, I I love M4, and I think it's because I had the Contigo, Contego, the Benchmade, and that was an M4, and I just loved that knife. I kind of regret getting rid of it, but I loved that knife, loved using it, um, and and that was definitely due to the blade itself, but. But that steel, I just, I loved it. And now I've got the uh, um, Blade Center, or not Blade Center, uh, Blade HQ exclusive Yojimbo with that steel. And I'm really, really loving it. So I think it was a good choice to go for the M4 on this little folder uh, because M4 has a much more um, uh, robust edge holding capabilities. And uh, it kind of seems like toughness isn't as big a deal on a small light knife. Uh, it's not like you're going to be hammering it into anything that you have to really worry about it uh, being too tough. So uh, yeah, bug out in uh, new steel, uh, new handle material and new uh, color colorway is what I'm hearing that term colorway. And I got to say it annoys the crap out of me, but everyone's using it. So they have a new colorway and a new handle material and the bailout with a new handle material and M4. Yes, I agree with you, sir. Um, I wish I had more empirical evidence as to why I like M4, but I just I just like M4. It seems to get really well. You know what? I'm not even going to get there. That 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 will just make me sound as ignorant as I am about the steel. Uh, hey, Alex, how you doing? Good to see you, man. And good to see your 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 ugly little Olamic in in your um in your what do you call it? <laughs> your little icon. I'm sorry. You know I don't like the Wayfair. James Moore, one thing coming soon, I hope, the Riot manufactured Sharp by Design Void. And I'm really looking forward to what Brian does with the upcoming Void XL. The Void, oh, the Void, the new, yes, 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 yes. That's his uh, new little um, EDC. It's got that large opening hole, and it looks, it's a cool looking knife. Uh, for a little knife, and I'm not hugely into little knives, but I really like the design of that one. And man, Brian Nadeau is just, phew, 
you know, I haven't even held one of his knives, but I feel like, uh, I feel like he's just, oh, he's amazing. I talked to him. He's amazing. Everyone I talked to who has his knife, like Alex, who has, who has that uh, beautiful arch nemesis. Um, they all say it's outstanding and all you have to do is look at it to know that so much work and consideration goes into them. So yeah, I, I think that'll be cool, especially the XL. Uh, that's a little bit more in my wheelhouse. A busker. I'm sorry. It's a busker and it's beautiful. Whatever it is, whatever it is. It's a, it's a knife only Alex can love because it's his. I'm just kidding. I'm, I'm sure I'm offending many people who love that little busker, busker, busker. What's a busker? That's someone who, uh, who sells things on the street. I think it's a British term. Uh, anyway, Lion Steel has just come out with a uh, new slip joint called the thrill. And uh, it's interesting. Lion Steel has been coming out with a lot of slip joints. Actually. Um, I have one right here, the Gitano. And I'm going to be talking a little bit about this in a while. Something, something went amiss and a little something amiss with this, but I took care of it and I want to tell you about it because you might be experiencing the same thing. So the Lion Steel Thrill is a, is a slip joint that they uh, ended, I guess, 2019 with. Um, but it is the most modern of their modern traditionals. A, in look, you look at it, uh, it's either you can get a titanium handle version or an aluminum handle version. And then it's got this long, narrow, well, that's not long, it's 3.15 inches, but it's got a narrow drop point, uh, very attractive looking blade with the sort of French French pulls on either side. And um, the the reason I'm bringing this one up is that it features uh, two, two lion steel um, signature technologies, if you will, or, or signature pro processes. I guess the first one is more of a process and that's, uh, it's int integral, uh, design and build. So these are made, uh, you know, fashioned out of uh, solid billets of titanium and of aluminum, and they are one piece. <laughs> and I got to say, it is such a thrill. You know what else is a thrill is they're using their kind of goofy, kind of cool uh, lock that disappears into the handle um, so that uh, when you're using the knife, your dainty little hands don't have to suffer uh, the feel of a clip in your hand. And so when you're not using it, it disappears into the uh, body of the handle. And then when you want to use it to pop it out, there's a, a button on the corresponding side that you just press and it, it elevates the clip out of the pocket. I mean, out of the, um, well, out of the pocket that it sits in, in the aluminum or titanium on the handle. And then you just slip in it. Actually, you know, I, I was being a little facetious, but it is a pretty cool, um, it's a cool feature, especially on a slip joint. However, this is such a modern looking slip joint that a clip on it would not be out of place. But I mean, how cool would it be to have a great Eastern cutlery with one of those or a real traditional looking traditional knife with a with a cool clip that pops out like that? I got to say that would actually be pretty nice because I got to say I'm, I'm getting tired of of the horizontal ride in my pocket with my slip joints. And I just cannot get with those big leather things in my front pocket. Uh, but uh, anyway, so that is, so one last thing, the name of this uh, lion steel clip is the Hawail, Hawail, H W A Y L clip all in caps. So I'm assuming that's an acronym Hawail, but it just does not roll off the tongue. H W a Y L. Um, so I don't know, maybe, maybe that's an acronym for something in Italian and actually sounds beautiful in that beautiful language, but, uh, not in ours, not in ours, sir. Uh, the last thing I wanted to bring to you from knife news. Um, one of my favorite websites is, uh, there's a new laser knife edge reader coming out. And what this thing does, uh, is well, it does exactly what it says. It reads the angles of your blade when you're sharpening it. Now, this was created by a, excuse me, a professional sharper named Ken Leonard. And um, I guess he made a few of these for himself. And then he made a couple smaller ones in 2019, not smaller, a small batch of them and sold them. And they, I guess, went like hotcakes because he has a Kickstarter now to, uh, to get more of these made. And this, at first I was like, oh my God, the nerdiness has just hit you know, red line, but actually, I mean, this is, this is a pretty amazing creation. I'm only looking at the still photo they have on knife news 
and uh, reading the article. And basically what it is, is uh, you have a triangular frame with a, with a curved back and the curved back, well, you hold it like this, hold it like this. <laughs> this is so scientific. You put your knife in it like this and then a laser points at the shit, excuse me, my French, a laser points at the edge and splits. And it, it is, uh, what's that term? When, when, when light hits water, it refracts and in different directions. And then it hits the, the ticker marks on the side that tell you what the angles are of both sides. I just made that way more complicated. Uh, how much, I don't know. You're going to have to get on that Kickstarter, James, because, uh, it seems to be ending on the 26th of January. So, so get in on it. He expects the whole thing to be finished by May, 2020. And, um, I'm reading here. It also gives you other information about the edge, um, not just the the bevel angles, but it will also tell you if it's dull, if you have a fuzzy or blurred refraction. Uh, it, that means it's dull. It will it will uh, help you with your convex edges uh, by giving you wider bands of light, and uh, and there are some other details. But it's a really cool looking contraption. I highly recommend you check it out. Go to Knife News. And uh, even if you're not interested in the laser knife edge reader, Knife News is definitely worth your time. Um, should I get this thing? Probably not, uh, but it is cool. And I say probably not because I don't think I'd use it, frankly. I, 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 uh, I might just get a little bit uh, too obsessed and, and have to stop. So laser knife edge reader. A cool, uh, cool innovation. And innovation is the topic we're going to discuss a little bit later on. And uh, I'm looking forward to that. I want to hear some of your thoughts about who you think the most innovative knife makers are. Who has created? <laughs> yes. Yes, Edwin. That's the thing. And I don't want to become OCD and, and be stressed. Like, oh, this side's 15 and a half and this side's 16. Like, oh, my God. You know, how could this ever cut? Uh, I, I could see that happening. Um, so anyway, let's move on to the state of the collection. Uh, I, I want to talk about a couple of uh, A, new knives, and B, well, actually, A, a couple of fixes I did to a couple older knives, and then I'll get to a couple of new things. Uh, as I alluded to earlier, oh, yeah, there it is. Now, that is a interesting and cool-looking um, contraption there. It looks like a real serious piece of engineering work. Yeah. Yeah, they're almost there. They're almost at their goal. So, uh, so James, get on it. And I don't mean you, Jim. <laughs> the other night I got into calling Jim James, and I don't even know why. I'm not even... Uh, he wasn't even in trouble. Okay, so the state of the collection. Oh, <laughs> all right, Alex. Enjoy that kickstart, and I'll, I'll talk to you in a while. Uh I mentioned earlier, I alluded to a, an issue with my Gitano, my beautiful Navaja-esque Gitano. I really fell for this knife, and it didn't take me long to, uh, to purchase it. And if you heard, it's got a very strong spring. And the reason I put it back very gently into its handle is that I was popping it back in because I like the sound and the walk and talk and the effect. But I noticed it felt felt like it was hitting. It felt like there was some blade wrap. Blade wrap is when the blade actually touches the uh, the inside spring on a slip joint. So when, the, when you close this hard and, and it kind of over flexes the spring for an instant because of how you're, how you're pushing it in, it'll hit the back spring or the back space or whatever it is. It's the back spring in this case and dull out a little, make a little flat spot on the, on the sweet spot right on the belly. And that's what I found here. And I was using it. I was cutting something and I noticed a drag right there. And so I just kind of turned it in the light and looked and I saw, I saw a, uh, you know, a flat spot, uh, a shiny spot where there shouldn't be a, a shiny spot right on the edge. And uh, sure enough, it was blade wrap. And so, you know, I just, uh, I took out my, my diamond stones and uh, 
<laughs> yeah, I know. Well, that's what I thought. I thought there was a blade stop. I was, well, there is, you can actually see it. I was like, surely this isn't an issue, but surely it was. And it might just be mine. It might just be my, uh, my sample. Um, but I just got out the, uh, the old diamond stones for the, for the sharp maker and went to town. Now I, I do have the KME, uh, but I didn't want to bring that out because, um, I haven't gotten very good at it and I didn't want to jack this knife up. So, uh, so anyway, if you have the Gatano and you're, and you're pushing it into your handle, just take a look, take a look right about here and see if there's a little flat spot. And if there is, I recommend you sharpen it out because what a drag. And then when you're putting it back in, you know, unless the girls are around and you're trying to impress them with the walk and talk, cause that's what they like. Then just put it in gently. All right, another fix. Another fix. This time it was my fault. <laughs> the edge reader's only 40 bucks. You got it on Kickstarter. Oh, man. <laughs> so I don't carry that kind of cash. You're going to have to send that cross country to me, Alex, uh, when I, when I want to take a look. My cold steel Luzon blade cuts the back. Ah. All right, well. Tyler, it's good to know. Thank you for saying that. Cause that's one of those, uh, the Luzon has been one of those knives that I'm like, uh, whenever I'm having a, a, a Jones and, uh, I really need to get a new knife, but maybe I don't want to spend the money or maybe I just know I'm not going to carry a new knife. I'm like, Hmm, maybe something for the extra large cold steel selection and, uh, or, or uh, collection, which is about 15 strong. Uh, yeah. Like 11 to 15 strong. Like I, I think I need to represent, you know, I, I need this representing my, and then I always kind of stop because I'll, I'll start watching um, reviews and they're usually pretty enthusiastic, but I've, I've read a couple um, on uh, uh, blade center, I guess, or knife center that uh, just kind of left me, uh, left me a little cold. So it's interesting to hear that it's cutting your backspacer. That's, that's hugely disappointing. Uh, then again, it is a big honking knife for 40 bucks. So I don't know how much, but, but I don't know. Should we expect that that won't happen? I, I think we can. I think we should. But uh, did you know one of the knives in the background is hanging crooked? Dude, I wasn't aware of that. Thank you. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It's, it's the bane of my existence. Well, I love the knife but I just have to figure out a new way to hang it. And the other thing that bugs me is that they're all in sheaths, except for the, except for that one, the Bowie. Uh, but the, the sheath that it came with was obviously not uh, original and it just, you know, it killed the buzz a little. So I, I love the way that looks, but thanks for pointing that out to me. I, I, I have to, I have to end this now. I'm just kidding. Uh, the second fix I did was to this Yojimbo two. Uh, this is an exclusive, GP knives, maybe I can't remember. It's 20 CV steel and real carbon fiber. And it's one of my few remaining carbon fiber knives as I'm not, I'm not so crazy about that material. Uh, but I am crazy about this knife and damn it. I did what I did to my very first Yojimbo and dropped it in the sink at work. Yes. Why did I have it out at the sink at work? Because I decided I had to cut some lunch with it, which was not smart. This is not a great lunch cutting knife anyway. And I have lunch cutting knives at work. And what I do, I cleaned it and I dropped it in the sink and look at that tip. But what I did, and you probably might not be able to, oh, there you go. You see that shiny spot at the end? Do you? Well, that's like a mini tanto point on this. Instead of, instead of sharpening all of this away, instead of sharpening like a 16th of an inch of the bottom off just to get the front to look how it should look, I decided to take the angle and sharpen it. But so it it goes up. It's hard to see here. But I've put a little secondary edge at the very tip. And actually, it 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 looks annoying uh when I when I when I open it, even though it's a very even though it's a very small bit missing from the tip, it just oh, it sticks in my craw because I know it's there and I can see it. But this little secondary edge is awesome. All right, Lynch versus MXG, which is better? Now, I do not, I cannot speak to that because I've only had MXG clips and I love them. However, 
I must say, well, two things. The Lynch clips are are tremendously popular, trusted, and loved by people we love and trust. So that's a good endorsement. And also, uh, someone commented, and I'm I'm sorry, I can't remember his or her, well, no doubt his name, uh, on my video on the MXG gear clips. And he said that he had some and that with sideways, uh, with, with too much sideways pressure, his broke. Um, that is not my experience at all. My, my experience is nothing but positive, but this guy was, was, uh, you know, kind of adamant and, and saying that he thought maybe now, I don't know what would, what would cause titanium to be brittle. I don't know anything about the titanium process, uh, how you work it or what you do with it before you send it out. But, uh, you know, the way, the way it was described by this commenter, it was as if it was overheat treated and got really hard and brittle. Uh, like I said, I haven't had that experience and mine are pretty flexible, but I mean, I haven't really, I haven't really yanked on them. So I don't know. I got to say personally, aesthetically, and I tend towards aesthetics. I like, <laughs> I like the MXG gear clip better because it has a circle and not a triangle here. Is that not ridiculous? I know. I know. I just like the way the circle looks, even though it makes it a total pain in the ass to screw in the screws on both sides because you have to come at it with an angle. And, uh, well, it's a pain in the butt. But anyway, so consider this. If you if you bust the, the tip off of your Yojimbo and it's not too extreme. Oh, look at that. You can see it right there. The tip is just... Pfft. But if you do break it off, consider doing this. Consider grinding the end into a little tanto tip. It is at least utilitarian. It works very well. Um, though, like I said, it just bugs me. Okay, on to the next one. I got the ah, CRKT Provoke. I got this as a direct uh, reaction to watching uh, Alex Alex, uh, Alex Tissot's Alex Knife Box's video about uh, some of his favorite knives, and he brings this up. I think it was his favorite purchase knives of of uh, 2019, and he had the the real deal. This is a CRKT version of the Joe Caswell uh, morphing karambit, and he actually has the morphing karambit from Joe Caswell because that's how Alex rolls, which I, which I find a impressive and b admirable. Um, but apparently there, this is a, a, a very close, a high fidelity representation of the actual custom, kind of like the 80 tens and the 80 fifteens, um, that cold steel is producing these days. I got to say this knife is even cooler than I expected it to be. Uh, I got it because I just, well, I love karambits, but I love the engineering. I just think that is beautiful. I mean, it just, uh, and then it locks open and it doesn't look like it, but it's comfy. It feels great in the hand. And this ring is nice. Uh, what I like about karambit rings, I don't have any other karambits right here, but I have the only other two folding karambits I have are the Fox Lynch. Okay. We're going to have to talk about this in a minute. Uh, the the uh, Fox Karambit, the 599, and I have the Emerson Karambit. And I like them both for different reasons, but the Emerson has the real wide, the, <laughs> the double wide um, ring because it's the two slabs of the of the side of the knife that come up. Whereas the, uh, the Fox just has a thin ring because it's the backspacer that's turned into a ring. This one has more of that Emerson feel, but even even feels better than the Emerson because it's fat, but it's completely solid. So in there, if you're if you're doing that kind of showy stuff or super secret tactical stuff, uh, it feels really good in the fingers. In the fingers. So uh, uh, I I found this on Amazon. I, I I'm trying not to shop too much at Amazon, but now they're moving to my locality. So I guess if I spend with Amazon, it's coming back to my community. That's my justification. And uh, I found this for 150 bucks, which is a good deal. Everywhere else I looked was 200, like solid, uh, 150 bucks. And then I believe on Amazon, you could get the multicolored one, which has, uh, I think it's olive drab or, or dark 
brown earth or whatever. It's black and another color. I think it's olive drab or tan. And uh, it looks cool as hell, but it was 10 more bucks. And I was like, mm. but now I kind of wish I got that one because it just looks cooler. But look at this. Just hanging out, you know. Oh, it's a nice big ring you have on your finger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Boom. Just like that. I mean, this is such a cool design. And it's not just innovation. It's This is actually useful innovation. It's not just we can do it, so we're going to do it, and it's cool. This would really be outstanding. And uh, outstanding in a real situation when you, where you need a karambit. Maybe, uh, yeah, I agree. This is a extremely unique says money i i agree it's uh i mean look at that but um i do think this would be great as i was saying in a pinch you need it to cut someone out of a seat belt or to cut someone cut someone off of you or whatever uh because of how it how it actuates so so simply um <laughs> i keep doing that off screen boom but something you must be aware of a caveat uh, if you're wearing this in your front right pocket, for instance, as I do, and you're drawing it, it'll wave off of your pocket if you're not careful. And and ordinarily, I'd say wave away, baby, wave away. But when I do it slowly, just to just to make sure it's not cutting my pants or cutting my leg or anything, it does appear as if, I mean, well, imagine this is the seam of the pocket, and it's inside the pocket as it draws. You know, it's opening in your pocket. So you really could mess yourself up or mess your pants up. So I, I try not to wave this, but if you needed to, you could, or if you wanted to. Now, they just came out with a um, first responders edition to this knife. And what makes it the first responders edition, I thought it was going to have like a blunted tip or something like that, or serrations, which they are coming out with VEF serrations on this, I believe. But, uh, what makes it a uh, uh, first responder is that they're putting it in a, they're including a Kydex sheath. And I think what that will do is totally eliminate the possibility of an accidental uh, deployment in your pocket. And that seems like it would probably be a good idea for first responders who, um, you know, don't want to have to worry about their, um, their tools when they're, when they're trying to use them for a greater cause and not just sitting, admiring them and doing this and annoying their wives. Okay. So the last of the state of the collection uh, knives is something that just came to me today. It came to me today, but it's an old knife that went out and has come back. And it is. It's my Hinderer XM 18, three and a half inch Spanto with the cool Python micarta scales. But check this out. Look at that. Look at that grind. That is Josh from Razor Edge. That's his work. Look at that. Okay, so Josh, uh, I had him on the podcast, I don't know, probably like six months ago or so. And uh, because I was just, you know, kind of drooling over his work, that's kind of what uh, a lot of the times that's what drives me to invite people onto the podcast, though I want to talk to everybody. Um, but, you know, I was just like, God, his, his, uh, his regrinds and his reblades are just, oh, they're so awesome looking. And so I had him on and we talked and what a, what a great guy he is. And <laughs> fancy, what a great guy he is. And so I was excited and, and, and I have three hinderers, two XM 24s and an XM 18. And I said, I'm sending you my XM 24s to get thinned out. And he said, ah, not so fast. He has a, he has a limit to the uh, expense of the knife he will handle. And the XM is just over or the XM24 was just over. And I said, well, I do have a fat Spanto, and these Spantos are beautiful, but this one is, I think from, this is a, this is the generation right before the triway pivot. So I think this is a generation four, and it's a fat sucker behind the edge. <clears throat> Josh, I asked him to uh, hollow grind it, and let's see if we can, it's hard to see, but he just, oh my God. God, he nailed it. It is so beautifully thin now. It's like a straight razor. And uh, his name, the name of his company, Razor Edge, is is extremely, extremely accurate because uh, I bumped it into my hand. Yes, yes. 
it's not just a beautifully thin hollow grind, but but the way it's finished, it's just gorgeous. Um, ooh, just sent your umnums on. Oh, dude, that's gonna be that will be nice. You will you will not be disappointed. I don't know if you've used him before, but and then look at where the tip meets the uh, the hollow grind, the main grind. That curve, I mean, it's just beautiful. So uh, I was I was making dinner tonight for the ladies, and one of the things, one of the ways I like to test knives, is how sharp they are. Once I sharpen them, is to kind of um, say you have a a package of meat, and you've got that thin cellophane on the top, like saran wrap. I like to just kind of let the weight of the knife. And the tip of the the sharpness of the tip of the blade goes through the cellophane, and then I'll just kind of hold the knife lightly and drag it along, and see if I can make it all the way around the the rectangle without stopping. And if you can make that curve in cellophane without any pressure, it's a it's a damn sharp knife. And this thing did that with a plum, and uh, <laughs> we'll get to that in a second, James. I'm I'm sorry about the busker, by the way. Uh, just kidding. And uh, so, yeah, knockout, knockout job. And I bumped it into my finger and I didn't cut myself because I bumped it really light, but it it, it gave me an immediate uh, sense of how thin and how damn sharp this thing is. So what a beautiful job. If you guys, because I'm sure you're all guys, <laughs> if you guys have a knife that you love, like I love this, but that blade is just mm, something about it or it's just not quite performing like if i had a if i had a uh, benchmade 940 i'd send it to him 940 yeah i think those I, that's thank you alex I, I would send it to him because that's a big fat blade and 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 he can just he can do the work and he just does beautiful work so anyway josh razor edge and uh i John Fitzin. That's interesting. I, I think of the exact opposite because to me, John Fitzin makes those super, uh, maybe you're being facetious and I'm not getting it because it's text, but he makes those super fat giant bowies out of huge slabs of steel. At least that's what I know him for. And uh, I'm sure his bowies are super sharp, but I don't know. I don't know. I just don't. I, it's an interesting correlation. You'll have to elaborate, sir. Uh, oh, I wanted to get back to, um, James Moore. He was mentioning that, uh, Josh does great work. My busker is fully functional now, thanks to his regrind and that previous, uh, of that previous thick edge. Okay. So that is exactly what I'm feeling about this, even though I only used it so far to open up a, a meat package, but it's the same thing. I'm like, wow, everything about this knife was fantastic except for how it cut. <laughs> and, uh, and now, now it's just great, but I'm not going to be prying open any car doors with it. So that's, that's a minus. <laughs> of course, I'm just kidding. Uh, another cool thing Josh did was he, he ground in a swedge. He, he continued the swedge because I think what he did, and actually I need to talk to him about this. When you do this kind of thing, you're removing a little bit of stock, say from the bottom. So when this knife came to me originally, it was slightly wider because it was because it had a lot more material. And he, I asked him to m remove material. And when you do that, it makes the knife slightly thinner. And I wonder if that throws off the aesthetics of this top line because he went in and did a freaking beautiful swedge up there. Look at that. Now the the normal um geez now I can't even remember if this had a swedge before. Uh, well, I do know it wasn't as beautiful as this one. So anyway, Josh, capital job, my man. Thank you so much and uh it was such a pleasure to come home and receive this after the craptacular day I had at the office today. So there you go. Thank you, sir. So that does it for the state of my collection. Uh, but uh, I talked about a couple of knives here that will bleed into the next thing I want to talk about, which is innovations in folders. And now here's where I would like to get uh, I'd like to get a little feedback from you. I'm going to I'm going to talk about a few people, uh, but I know I'm missing a lot. Uh, we have this hobby. We have this. Some of us have an obsession. Uh, and it's full of people who are make good people who are making good knives amazing knives 
but they're not just settling for that. They want to do something different. They see problems that others don't see. And that's the first thing you need if you're going to do anything successful, if you ask me. You need a problem to solve. And uh, um, the, okay, let's get into it. Uh, uh, Chris Reeve solved the problem with the, with the integral lock. John uses that name as well as Razor's Edge. He does do the uh, thing. You're correct. John uses that name as well, Razor's Edge. He does do the. I'm not exactly sure. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what you're talking about, sir. Uh, Alex and I need to convince two more people to go for the edge reader. Well, you know what? Maybe I'll do it. Maybe I'll do it. If by the time this is uh, this is done, if it's not done, I will take it. But anyway, Chris Reeve, the frame lock, the integral Reeve lock. I would say, well, that was his innovation, and I would say that it has. Uh, kind of influenced air, like most of the knives we all like right now, these titanium frame locks. Um, you know, <laughs> it was a great idea, uh, kind of a maybe an obvious idea, but, and by obvious, I mean, if you're already making knives and you're using the Walker, the Michael Walker liner lock, and, uh, well, I could see I could see how you could extrapolate out. But the point is, Chris Reeve did. And not only did he uh, come up with this revolutionary uh, frame lock, but he was also at the same time innovating in terms of the build itself, uh, that the super high tolerances, the uh, the attention that the, the hand, uh, the time spent in workers hands, as well as on the machines, you know, um, I think he not only innovated this lock, but but may have uh, done a great deal to innovate a, the process of making knives. I could be just talking out of, I could be just talking out of my mouth. Let me know. But uh, I feel like that. <laughs> I feel like, hey, I got that from David C. Anderson, uh, totemic. But uh, we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> um, so. Uh, let's see. Sharp by Design's D10 system is pretty. Oh, oh my gosh. He's not even on my list. You're right. Okay. Sharp by Design. Brian Nadeau, the way he does his detent, it's not a ball pressed into it. It's not some stinking detent ball stuck in a hole. He, <laughs> he takes that piece of titanium and like a sculptor would, would walk up to a piece of marble and chip away everything that's not David. He walks up to that piece of titanium and mills away everything that that's not that tiny little um, nub. I think he called it a nub uh, instead of the uh, so so it's a one solid piece of titanium and the um, and the detent instead of a detent ball, it's a detent nub and it's milled right into the titanium. It's a, a brilliant innovation and uh, I'm not sure if it's patented and I'm not sure if people are starting to rip it off or not or not rip it off, but borrow the technology. Uh, maybe he should patent it if he hasn't, because uh, he could make a boatload of money, kind of like uh, kind of like every time you drill a circular hole into a blade, you have to pay Sal Glesser. Speaking of knife maker innovations, I love Jason Guthrie's use of tungsten carbide rod inset into the lock bar to act. Oh, interesting. Tungsten carbide, a super, super, super hard material. I know a lot of uh, tough guys, uh, who get tungsten carbide wedding rings. Uh, I, I have a bunch of friends who have them. And actually, a funny story. Uh, one guy, um, Drew Swift, he was a guest on this show, former uh, Marine Scout sniper, uh, <laughs> was showing off to his friends how tough his tungsten carbide wedding ring was. And he pulled it off and he threw it down at the floor and hit a sweet spot and the whole thing shattered into a billion pieces. So apparently tungsten carbide is very hard, but also very brittle. So if you have a tungsten carbide wedding ring, uh, I don't suggest you throw it at the cement ground because it will shatter. But uh, yeah, that is an interesting innovation and a great idea because of that, because of the function it's performing. It's not receiving any impact and just that hardness against the steel blade will eliminate any any lock stick. That's a great idea. Uh, I want to talk about Bob Terzuola, uh, who basically, um, you know, 
They call him the godfather of uh, tactical knives, uh, tactical folding knives. And uh, after talking to him on this show, and I want to have him back on because he just re-released his his uh, book with some, uh, his book is called The Anatomy of a T Tactical Folder, I think. And he just did an updated uh, edition of it and it looks sweet and I can't wait to get it. Um, actually, I should get a signed copy, I think. Um, but anyway, uh, so he was the first to kind of do the tactical folder. Um, and that was due to some, uh, he was down in Guatemala and some, uh, I think some alphabet agency spooks or some, I can't remember. I, I have to listen to the podcast again, but he, uh, some people knew he was making knives. He was working in a jade carving factory, but also making uh, fixed blade knives. And then he, uh, uh, a, a need for a smaller, more discreet yet tactical knife came up and he, he came up with the, uh, with the ATCF, the advanced tactical combat folder, advanced technology combat folder. I'm terrible with acronyms. Please help me. Uh, but he still making that knife outstandingly gorgeous. Ugh, had to bring up Terzul. <laughs> yeah, I know. Oh, my. Oh, only two. They're the only two. Lucky man. Yeah, yeah, really. I saw him, uh, Terzuola, um, Bob Terzuola, on Instagram this week was showing off a knife he's making for a friend who's turning 50. And I'm like, damn, I'm going to be turning 50 in a couple of years. How do I get on this? How do I get on this best friends list? Anyway, he was showing, he was, it, he's making an a, a, ATCF and, and I love that blade. And in the blade, it was uh, some really beautiful Damascus steel. I can't remember what kind, but in the flat of the, uh, of the blade, right up here he had five uh gold little gold bars that he had put through and and then sanded off so that so that on the blade on both sides you see five golden dots each dot representing a decade of his friend's life and uh, it almost brought me to tears i'm like that is so cool that is like such a cool gift and uh yeah such a beautiful knife and tom mayo Jesus. Jeez, oh, Pete. Sorry for the French. I think his knives are so cool, man. I think, but I mean, you know, Tom Mayo's plane is going to have to crash in my backyard to ever actually have one. I would say not the best, but the most innovative night maker right now is Joe Caswell. Oh, so he's on my list. He's on my list. And um, the only thing I could, I can really um, point to is, is the morphing Karambit. However, I do know that, um, I remember he, uh, someone I follow on YouTube a few years ago got a knife of his, and I, I don't remember who it was, but it was also very innovative and engineering, <laughs> uh, and uh, it had a worn, not a worn cliff blade, it had like a sheep's foot blade. It was a big, fat titanium tactical thing, it had a special lock, but I, I don't remember what it was. James, if you know Mr. Mayo, please send me his, his, uh, email address so I can cold, cold reach out to him. I would, I've been trying to find some way to contact him because I want to interview him. Um, so if you're comfortable with that, I am too. Um, but Alex, if you remember, uh, what that, what that other knife is called, or if you know what I'm talking about, it's got a handle that sort of tapers towards the back. It's a big kind of blocky titanium. It's got that sheep's foot blade and I think a weird clip and a weird lock. And by weird, I mean innovative and interesting and different. Um, he's another uh, gentleman I've reached out to and who has an interest of coming on the show, but haven't haven't quite worked out the dates yet. But uh, okay, thank you, James. If, if that's cool with you, that would be really awesome with me. And then uh, I'll mention you on the podcast. Stan Wilson, flipper, non-flipper. Okay, okay. I can't talk to that. I know I've seen it and I, I think I've seen it somewhat recently. Is this maybe Alex has something like that? I can't remember. Um, flipper, no flipper, which leads me to what I can kind of talk about is uh, Gus Sacchini's SLT flipper, which is a really cool innovation. I mean, his knives, I mean, you look at them and they're, they're just, you know, everything about them uh, reeks of innovation. You know, like who who would think to make a knife that looks like that? Uh, this, 
I have this in the collection because, well, there are a number of reasons, but I keep it in the collection because it is so unique. And uh, I also think it's beautiful. But this uh, SLT, which will tell me what SLT stands for, I can't remember. Jeez, I can't remember a lot tonight, guys. Uh, but to me, it's a 100% unnecessary but terrifically cool uh, innovation. Uh, it it it's sort of uh, it's sort of like a two stage trigger on a on a gun on a revolver or a rifle, and uh, it is pretty neat. And and you can feel there's like a slight there's a difference in the action between something like this and something like this. Uh, well. It got caught in my little lanyard, I swear. But uh, yeah, I think Gus Cicchini it, um, has an, an eye like no others and a design sense like no others. And then this this little innovation kind of kind of takes it from art into engineering, I feel like. And by the way, this is a great blade. Not only a great blade shape, but a great blade. I mean, this thing cuts awesome. And you awesomely. And you wouldn't think so from looking at it, or I didn't think so from looking at it, but this is an outstanding knife. Maybe not the most comfortable, um, but a great knife. Uh, okay. Love the kickstop flipper mechanism. Now, is the kickstop flipper mechanism, is that case? Wait, what is case? Uh, okay. Lee Williams kickstop. Oh God. Now everyone's like case. Oh my God. All right. Tell someone's got to tell me about the Lee Williams kickstop because it's been brought up three times now. And, uh, well, I'm ignorant and I'm not exactly sure what that is, but I think, okay, hold on to that. Hold on to that for a sec. Um, I believe it's kind of like the, uh, um, other people have been using this, the Lee Williams kickstop. Is that right? Uh, you see it on the, you see it on this side, but when you flip it through it, it's not on this side. Is that what that is? Someone just give me a yes. If not, I'll have to do some research and then eat crow on the next one and tell everyone what, what I've learned, what I've learned that you already know. How could we have this conversation without mentioning Sal Glesser? Sal Glesser, pocket clip, one-handed opening and round spider hole. Uh, which fuck, brilliant to to patent that it's a hole it's a circle he patented a circle it's like patenting you're fired and making you know charging everyone to to, to say you're fired brilliant idea uh, so the pocket clip the one-handed opening the compression lock uh, a new ish innovation for them and actually i don't know if sal glesser himself came up with that okay thanks james that's what i thought it was the kick stop wingman edc yes okay all right that's where i've seen it recently uh I, not on lee williams knives themselves because i'm not too familiar with that but it is like the slt okay all right uh Sp spider co compression lock that was theirs uh i'm not sure if sal himself came up with it but you know the buck stops with sal right and eric so they are the innovators and then the the fourth innovation or thing that they were really known for um is serrating their blades and um you know for a while they a lot of their things were fully serrated um now you can get most things fully serrated but uh yeah i mean to me to me, Sal's uh, Sal. I just call him Sal because I know him like that. But to me, he's way up there because a lot of the things we take 100% for granted on all of our knives kind of came from him. Uh, and and maybe they didn't, but he's the one who popularized them for sure. Uh, I want to talk about Ernest Emerson. I know he's a polarizing figure. Well, he's not a polarizing figure, but his knives are. Some people, some people aren't fond of them, and it's not because of the design. Let me put it that way. But the wave, the wave feature. Yes, the wave feature. When you draw it from your pocket, you all know this, but I'm going to do it anyway. When you draw it from your pocket, it grabs your seam and boom, pops the knife open. Such a cool innovation. And it wasn't it wasn't an innovation as much as a happy accident, uh, uh, I believe. Is that right? 
I'm not sure if that's right, actually, but uh, he was making these for Navy SEALs. Not this, this is the CQC-13, but I think he was making uh, the CQC-6, maybe? Bef the pre, before the seven, the big, the, it doesn't matter. He was making uh, some knives for, for uh, it was a happy accident. I'm remembering it now. He was making some knives for Navy SEALs, and he put this on here as a traditional blade catch, like you're in a knife duel with someone and they come at you and you catch it right there like a spanish notch you know on an old bowie um but pretty quickly apparently as the story goes he, he left a, a couple of knives with the seals and pretty quickly they realized that a blade catcher is 100 percent unnecessary but it opens when you pull it out of your pocket it automatically opens and you can open beer cans with it. So they thought, hey, this is a great thing. Now, I've tried to open beer cans with probably all of my waves, and I can't manage it. But I think since, uh, you know, since then, the design has changed. So who knows? Maybe this was a little sharper on the inside, and you could just... But I do know you can use the tang on an Emerson to open beers or to open bottles right there. Not only that, but most Emersons are front flippers, too, because the tang protrudes. And... uh People think that's some new great innovation. Psh, Ernest Emerson's been doing it for years. He just didn't know it. Uh, let's see. Uh, anyone who knows me knows I, I love it. Did say, yes, I know. I don't have any beer right now, but coffee will have to suffice. Mm. Ah, that's delicious brew. Whomever started implementing the forward finger choil deserves an innovation award too. Strider was probably early in the game on that one. You're right about that. Actually, uh, I think they were one of the first ones. I think I read that somewhere. Um, finger choil. Not sure. Not sure how I feel about it. I have a lot of knives with it, and a number of them, even even my beloved uh, beloved uh, XM18, kind of wish it didn't have a choil. Kind of wish it had a little bit more cutting edge. And that's not because I've been using it, and I'm like, wow, I could really use an eighth more uh, an eighth inch more cutting edge. It's just aesthetics. I like the way it looks better. Uh, I'm a shallow person when it comes to aesthetics and, uh, you know, so who else here? Andrew Demko, Mr. Demko. Hey, Rusty. Good to see you. Glad you're here. We're kind of at the end of the show, but, uh, right now we're talking about innovations. Oh, Edwin love Emerson. Edwin has the machinist the machinist uh, uh emerson collection that i know of i mean it is beautiful and and you seem to be getting more and more this seems to be a growing habit jim can you bring that back up i i didn't have a chance to read it i was bloviating i uh, love emerson but we all know that lol his es1m was designed for seals later smaller civilian versions known as the commander oh oh yes yes do you have one i think you have one of those you just got one right an es1m I think you did. What a what a gorgeous knife. And I'm wondering, Edwin, does that knife have a different um, different kind of inner profile that would allow you to open beers? Not that it's that important, but I'm curious. I agree. For smaller knives, it helps me get my hands. Yes. Yeah, you're, you're talking about the choil now. Yes, on smaller knives. That's a good point, Rusty. I, I do like the finger choil on smaller knives. The Sage three or uh, the Sage two. You know, it would be completely unmanageable without it. A lot of the little spider codes would be completely unmanageable. Yes, I do. <sighs> well, it's beautiful. Let me assure you, sir. I think you put a po picture of that up today or yesterday. You do a lot of uh, Instagram, so it's hard to hard to remember. But you had a you had a sh cool shot here. I'll use my Emerson for it. Or you had a cool shot of it like this, and you could really, really like see the grinds. Not just the, you know, you could see all the grind lines. It was a beautiful picture. Nicely done, sir. I always know when it's one of yours. Uh, by the way, I want to find out where you get all those awesome uh, custom Emersons. and Because I might have to get one and sell off everything I own to get one. But I, ah, they're just beautiful. I also love the innovations. The good-looking Curtis and Gareth Bull oversized pivots. Yes. Okay, that, that was up a little bit before. That also act as the overstop. Uh, I, the, I agree. I agree. I'm, I'm not as um, 
I'm not as keen on it, on the looks of it, I got to say, especially on the Gareth Bull. Excuse me. But I love the fact that it is the over over travel stop. And I know that that pivot is not as thick as how it presents on the handle. But I like the idea of a super thick pivot for some reason. I don't know why. Maybe I shouldn't get into that. Uh, but back to Andrew Demko, um, the triad lock. Oh, the Iron Dragon. Beautiful. Beautiful Iron Dragon. Double deep detent slip joints. Okay. Well, I'll have to get back to that. I haven't experienced any double detent slip joints. Have I? Oh, like the like the, the Isham, maybe? Um, anyway, Andrew Demko, triad lock. What an innovation that was. Just to stick a, a, a stop pin between the lock bar and the blade itself to absorb all that shock. Now, um, all that shock. I, I, I don't put my knives through much shock, uh, but that's what it's there for, to distribute force throughout the frame of the knife. And it's such a simple innovation, uh, not a simple process. So, you know, you can listen to that podcast number 20, where he talks about the maddening process of actually making a triad lock, a custom triad lock. But uh, it, it is a simple thing on, on its face. And, and to me, like, simple innovation that, that really makes life better. And if you consider a great lock on a knife making life better, you know, that definitely uh, fits the bill. He also did the, uh, he also innovated the Scorpion lock which is the uh, the back strap lock on the AD-15, which is cool and it's fun and it's fidgety um, and it's very strong, but I don't quite have the confidence in it uh, as I do the triad. And that's marketing. Uh, that's marketing. Uh, I've seen so many of those proof videos. Uh, I'm maybe one of three or four people who aren't offended by seeing dead pigs, you know, halved by swords. To me, it just kind of, it's like proof of concept. Um, but, you know, I, <laughs> hey, Steve, good to see you, man. Good to see you. We're just talking about innovation right now in folders. And I was talking about Andrew Demko's Scorpion Lock. The Ant Lock, that's the new one from um, Real, not Real Steel, Steel Will. I have not tried, that's on their new, uh, I can't remember the name of that knife now. Jeez. It's too late in the day, guys. I think I blew all my memory earlier. No one said the axis lock. I didn't get to the axis lock. Oh, I'm sorry. This is an able lock. This is not an axis lock. This is the, uh, okay, as you all know, the the axis lock, Benchmade's signature innovation and, and uh, you know, signature lock. Uh, the patent is run out and people are jumping all over it. it uh, SOG has their XR lock, which is very, very similar. Um, you know, a, a bar lock that extends across the tang. Uh, the able lock is the, uh, let's see, Alex helped me with this last time, advanced. No, no, no. Ambidextrous bar lock enhanced. Able lock. Ambidextrous bar lock enhanced. That's right. I remembered. Uh, what an amazing innovation this is. And man, I got to say, Hogue is killing it. This, this, this uh, um, able lock set up on the Hogue. I just love it. It's so smooth and really super robust there's like there's no play and in my experience uh my limited experience with benchmade i've only had four or five yes yes that is a good favorite knife to have rusty it, it is i it was probably my most carried i think i mentioned this as my most carried in in 2019 um whew, i don't even remember what i was saying <laughs> uh oh okay Steve, did you just get an AD15 by AD himself, or did you get it from CS? I'd be interested to find out. Um, I, in talking to uh, in talking to Andrew Demko, he seemed to be very confident that the cold steels are just almost like his customs. But you would get one of his customs to a have something that he made, and to b get get it custom, get it how you want it and see to get the, you know, to, to get the real sweet feel that you would get from something that's labored over uh, by a single individual. So let me know. Benchmade bug out and bailout aftermarket is awesome. Uh, agreed. I love my bug out 
with my Carta bailout. Not so sure about because of all the bad press. However, as I mentioned earlier, they're they're coming out with their new aluminum handled carbide glass breaking um, M4 Toten version uh, this year, and that one I will probably get. Uh, though I must say, okay, Cold Steel. That was a reasonable choice, especially if you weren't sure about it. That <laughs> uh, the the glass breakers on the, on the ends of knives really, even though uh, I use them for road trip knives, they they bug the, the 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 crap out of me because I I would like to always be able to have the option to put my thumb up here, and like with my uh, my Troodon from. 2016 it's like putting your hand on a nail it's so freaking sharp i thought about the mg 80 oh 15 demco just haven't done it wait the mg is that the one is that like the uh mid tech kind of the mid tech version mg i can't remember please uh elaborate uh joe caswell grant and gavin hawk who i also spoke to recently oh you got an orange one nice i love so Knifeworks is the only place you can get this. And actually, uh, I was talking to David C. Anderson from the Knife Center last night. Um, I was interviewing him for the show that's coming up this Sunday. And he was so, I, I started talking about this knife and he was, he was so um, enthusiastic, except he had to be a little bit reserved. <laughs> you, could, you could tell the enthusiasm was bubbling up uh, under the surface, but he had to, he had to play it cool. Uh, and he kind of explained that and I, I asked him to elaborate and he's like, it's a, it's a knife works exclusive. I can't, I can't just be, you know, talking up someone else's product, but, uh, but damn, what a nice knife. And, and I agree with him. This thing is sweet. And then it just takes the cake that it's 20 CV. Oh, I do have a uh, spirited whiskey says I do have a beautiful custom direct from Le uh, Ray Laconico Jasmine dual thumber on washers with barked titanium killer anno job arriving tomorrow. Not if I get there first spirited whiskey, <laughs> just kidding. That sounds beautiful. I love his designs. They are clean classic. And, and I, I kind of think they please a lot of different people because uh, as you, as you might know, because I say it all the time, I tend towards knives that emulate kind of weapons more just because that's who I am. And I think Ray Laconico's knives flex back and forth. They just, you know, if you feel like looking at them that way, you can. And if you just feel like looking at it as a classy, beautiful um, pocket knife, you can do that too. But man, that sounds, that sounds beautiful, especially the, uh, especially the, uh, the barked handle. The Hogue Deca looks great too. Yes, I agree. Um, but if we're talking looks, one too many elements in there. I'm not sure if it's too many screws or too many hash marks in the in the grooves on the handle or uh, too many angles to the handle or too many angles to the blades like on the um, clip. And don't get me wrong. I will be getting both of them. Uh, but the the thumb ramp on the clip point. This is going to sound funny, but it looks a little antiquated now to me that thumb ramp thing. Uh, I don't know. Maybe it's just that I've grown past it because I like to put my thumb forward. Um, there's that. And then the, uh, they have the blade that the worn cliff that is kind of looks like that. And it's kind of ugly, but you know what? I, I, ugly has never stopped me. Ugly. Even though I always talk about aesthetics, there can be an aesthetic to ugly kind of like ET, the, the alien, you know, cute and hideous at the same time the deadlock or hawk lock is very innovative and that's what i was getting to next i don't know how they do it even though i asked them <laughs> but uh but uh in talking to them about the um the deadlock first of all i mean just gorgeous to me it's 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 uh it's almost as beautiful as the arch nemesis uh in terms of just beautiful daggery knives but it is 100% solid, at least how they describe how uh, the knife feels in the handle, which is very um, unique in and out the front or any sort of, well, in and out the front automatic. In pretty much every out the front automatic, and I have I have three. I have two, two beautiful Microtechs 
uh, out the front and I have a, um, a lightning and they all have that blade play. And that's, that's so that, so that the internals can allow the knife to actually move and come out. There has to be some space there, but the Hawks innovated a way to have that knife, uh, rocket forth, but not have any blade play. And they explained it and psh, it just, phew, but I have to, you know, listen to that podcast and they explain it. And to me, to me, it's very, very cool because it's not really a serious problem that needs to be solved, but it is a problem, blade play. And yes, we might grow to uh, accept it or even embrace it in certain kinds of knives, but we don't have to, especially if there are people like Grant and Gavin Hawk out there kicking butt and innovating. The mud pivot, the mud pivot, that was the other thing I was going to say about Grant and Gavin Hawk. The mud pivot um, keeps out, it's totally encapsulated, so it encapsulated, so it keeps out mud. <laughs> How about that? Mud, muck, grit, dirt, whatever, lint. It can't get in there, and those are the kind of things that retard the movement of a blade on a, on a switchblade, on an automatic, I'm sorry. Switchblade is a divisive term uh, on an automatic knife i bet automatic is kind of sounds scary to a lot of people too on one of those push button knives uh, uh that that come out the side that grime and grit can really mess things up but uh the way they they set that up you can you know you can do anything to it and it's still going to open up also they have they do the same thing kind of with the button it looks like nothing can get in there because it looks like there's kind of a a, a covering gasket but uh yeah those guys are those guys are really cool and and uh, it was neat talking to them because um Grant Hawk originally went out to to uh to Idaho Idaho yeah to uh or you to Idaho to uh do gold mining which to me is like wow that's cool that's like that's go west young man uh, go west and seek gold it's, it just sounds like a cool thing and then he transitioned into knife making Jim can you bring that last one up I was, uh, I didn't see what it said. Steve says, I just finished listening to your G&G &G Hawk podcast today. Another great one. Thank you very much, Steve. Maybe you can tell me how they made the deadlock. Uh, <laughs> no, I, 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 uh, I think it's really cool. And now I, I, this, this happens with every interview, literally every interview after I hang up after we're done, I'm like, all right, now I got to figure out how I'm going to get my hands on a deadlock or, uh, you know, now I got to figure out how I'm going to get my hands on a, on a, uh, well, you name it, man. Any, anyone I've interviewed, I've, I've wanted their knives. So it's just the cross I have to bear. Spirited Whiskey says, can we talk about the fact that I'm very happy to see makers moving back to Teflon and phosphor, uh, bronze washers over the caged bearings that have so taken over. Agree. A hundred percent agree. 100%. Um, I don't get me wrong. I love this. Oh, wow. Oh, all I have to do is tilt it and it closes. But really, it it has no bearing on anything. Bearing. It has no bearing on anything. <laughs> See what I did there? That's awesome. I mean, yes, it does flip it open very smoothly and beautifully. And uh, But, like, you don't really need to close your knife fast. You don't really need to close your your knife in a specific way. Really, you kind of need to open your knife in a specific way. And I guess that's what what that's due to but but when you when you watch many youtubers you'll see them talk about oh that that's what's so and it's a cool pleasing uh byproduct but the problem is and i just had this problem with a uh, i gave my good friend uh kurt zapeta who was one of my first interviews on this show he's a friend of mine and a, a firefighter and and emt and uh he uses knives for his job a lot but i gave him um my Kaiser Cucciara El Dorado, a knife I, no, not El Dorado, Dorado, a knife I love and, uh, but just had been trying to sell for years. I don't know why it was like, kind of like, I love this knife, but it's one I can sacrifice. <sighs> uh, anyway, I gave that to him as a gift because he was always admiring it. And I finally, I gave it to him uh, when he hit a couple of landmarks in his own life as a commemorative knife and he'd been carrying it and showing it off uh for about a month 
And that's probably uh, longer than I ever carried it in the few years I had it. You know, he probably carried it more in that month than I carried it in the several years I had it. And in that time, it, it, it went from super, super smooth bearing action to uh, like gritty, like barely closing, not barely closing, but uh, it wasn't, it was barely locking up. And I suspected it had something to do. So anyway, I opened it up and cleaned it. And it was back to beautiful normal. And I'm like, this guy's not doing it. You know, my friend's not, he's not, he's not out in the muck and the mire, uh, getting this thing filled up with, with crap. It's, it's in his pocket and he's pulling it out for the occasional light cutting task or to, to show it off. Uh, how is it that those bearings attracted so much schmutz? And then I realized maybe it's because I put a little bit of, uh, a little, a little KPL on it before I gave it to him to make sure it was super smooth. And sometimes if you overdo it with the lubrication, it just attracts crap from your pocket lint and stuff and it'll slow the knife down. I think that, I think that's what happened here. And I think if, if, uh, if the knife were on Teflon or phosphor bronze, Oh, heaven forbid Teflon, uh, it wouldn't have happened. Plus it's a little, I think that it's easier to center a blade that has the bearings, but I think, uh, the phosphor bronze washers are actually stronger in that direction. So anyway, I agree with you. That's that's my long way of saying I agree with you. Oh, oh my God. Yeah, this dude, I don't even know what to think of this guy. He is some kind of a mad genius. I don't know how to even pronounce his name, which kind of sucks. Snick, snicks. Um, but yeah, that you know, if you watch his uh if you watch his videos, I mean he just he spends so much time, energy, attention, and uh, just passion designing his knives and then putting them together. And he shows, uh, I think with a build he did a couple of years ago, um, I can't remember what it was called, but he shows you every aspect of it and, and how they innovate. And yes, Alex, I agree with you. The way that whole thing comes apart without tools, but when it's together is super tight and, and you know, presumably super tight. That is pretty cool. And and speaking of that, there's also the Ken Onion um, thing uh, that CRKT is using, the Ken Onion uh, field strip technology. Technology. I always think it's funny when we say technology for something that's not that you don't plug in. But of course, technology is just an innovation. Field strip technology. Thank you, sir. Thank you. It's not the CRKT thing. <laughs> um, Pretty cool. Never, never used it. Uh, it seems like when the YouTubers I watch take them apart and put them together, they come apart and go together very easily. And everything kind of seems to fit right back into place, which is nice. Uh, that's what you want when you're taking apart, when you're taking apart a knife. Um, I think that's about, I think that's about it. I think that's about it for my talk of innovation. Um, if there's a comment that I missed, Jim, I'm not sure if I addressed all of them. I think there was a last uh, one, two, two comments ago that I missed or something. But if not, I agree. Uh, I, I agree. If not, sorry, doesn't matter. Uh, one last thing, Alex, if you would get back to me, uh, you said Lynch clip, exclamation, 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 and another one, exclamation. Uh, tell me why. If you can, just just blast that out real quickly and let me know why you think Lynch is so much better. Uh, it doesn't look better, and you know that's what really counts for me. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but like I said, one of my uh, one of the commenters on one of my videos said that he had some trouble with brittleness in the MXG gear titanium. I have not had that issue, but it's something to note. Um, everyone has their own experiences. So tonight, before we end... Uh, I'm going to do a knife fight debate like I normally do on Thursday Night Knives, uh, but I'm doing it by myself. I'm debating myself, um, which I don't know if I should show the public. <laughs> but anyway, tonight's knife fight is the Hinterer XM18 versus the Strider SMF, or I guess SNG. I I'm going to use those interchangeably. Okay, I will take the XM18 first. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for having me at this forum for this very important debate. Uh, I would like to discuss the merits of the XM18. The XM18 comes with a super robust blade. It comes with very dependable um, 
Nylatron washers on a titanium and uh, on a titanium frame with G10 handles. Now these are ingredients that we expect to see on a lot of, a lot of knives these days. However, Hinderer was one of the first to out of necessity from his first job as firefighter and horsebreaker, which is kind of a cool combination. He moved the knife over, Bob. Thank you. <laughs> he decided that he had to come up with a knife that was more robust than the others he was using. And in this discussion, we are going to talk about an innovation that I can't believe I missed before. And that's the Hinderer Lock Bar. Uh, what the hell is this called? The Hinderer, uh, um, oh boy, I'm losing this debate. Anyway, he came up with the with the over travel stop device. And to me, that is an innovation that deserves a claim. Um, I just sent this knife off to have it uh, reground in a way that was more suitable to me and my desires and needs. But that is no, um, that is no bad, that does not cast a bad light on Hinderer. Uh, knives themselves. They are, they are built to be robust, and if you choose them to be more slicey and dainty, well, you can have that done too. The XM18 is a, um, is a true innovative knife. It's a, it's a knife that flexes from tactical, or that flexes from utility to tactical. And uh, in that respect, I would have to say uh, that the XM18 is a superior knife. Uh, that was not great. That was not great. But as the moderator, I will move it along to Bob, who is going to be talking about the Strider SMF slash SNG, <clears throat> which I don't have, by the way. I used to have an SMF and I sold it. And that, that was a regrettable move. But okay. The Strider SMF is clearly the superior uh, tactical folding knife because of its construction. It has two pieces. It has one piece, uh, two pieces to the handle. It has one piece of titanium, and then it has one piece of G10 that is milled to form the backspacer uh, uh, that meets with the titanium side of the blade. Now, this is not only something that looks good and interesting. This is something that is important because it adds rigidity, strength, and simplicity to a knife that's supposed to be used uh, for hard use. Now, the SMF introduces the finger choil that, uh, that is also featured here in the, uh, in the XM18. However, it is more generous and, and fits better with the ergonomics of the rest of the handle. You look at the handle of an SMF and it looks uncomfortable. It looks like a doorstop. However, when you hold it in your hand, you see that that doorstop is, is very comfortable. And then when you reverse it, you have jimping on the back and it, and it stays in your hand quite well. Uh, it also comes with a super robust blade. And uh, I never got mine reground, but um, you can do that too with, a, with an SMF. Uh, all right, you're seeing right through me. I'm, I'm ending this debate right now. I love the XM18. I sold my SMF. I would like to get an SNG. Maybe I'll get the ProTech uh, <laughs> because because uh, <laughs> I'm feeling cheap. Not that ProTechs are cheap, but they're cheap. They're less expensive than the than than the Striders. The Striders are just weird knives. I don't know. I don't know. I really want to get one back in my collection um, because I love hate them. Um, they actually do feel great in my hand. I kind of wish they had a better blade to handle ratio. I kind of wish they didn't have the choil uh, because that takes away a lot of the, the cutting. Uh, you know, like I, I feel we, we talked about choils a little bit earlier, finger choils. I kind of feel like uh, they should be reserved for more, I don't know, outdoorsy knives, more utility knives, but knives that are, that are more tactical. That kind of just seems like a waste of space. That being said, uh, the smaller knives, um, really do benefit from the toil. All right. I've bloviated long enough. Uh, it's been a pleasure. I know, um, I know it's late and everyone has to get some sleep. Everyone, including myself, the coating on the Lynch is way better for me. Okay. So it's the coating. Have you, you haven't had experiences with brittle or anything on the MXG gear. 
Really? Okay. Rusty has also had way better luck. That means you've had bad luck with the with the MXG. I'd be I'd be interested to hear what that is. Counterpoint. I like the I like yes. And the one ooh, this sounds like the knife debate we should have had maybe next time. Uh I like all my MXG clips, and the one lynch clip I got from Blade HQ came very scratched up, according to them, as received from Lynch. N equals one, of course. What is that? What is n equals one? I, I'm terrible at math, and you start putting letters in math, it's like algebra, and then I'm really lost. Uh, if you could elaborate, that'd be cool. So I don't seem like a jerkish moron. Um. Anyway, oh, lock bar stabilizer. Thank you, thank you. That's what I was trying to say, and and I figured out why they call it a stabilizer. It's an over travel device and that's why, but it stabilizes the lock this way. So you can't compress the lock by pushing it in this way. I think, what do you, you know, I don't know. Maybe that's just me with too much time on my hands. Love my monkey edge frag SNG. Oh, that sounds, that sounds beautiful. Actually, that's, that's, I like the concealed carry version of, of all of those knives, um, but I've never held them and I don't know how they feel, but I do know the big blocky Lego handles are awesome. I mean, they 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 are uh, counterintuitively comfortable. So uh, yeah, I, I do have to get an SMG buy directly from Lynch. They won't be scratched. Uh, I, I definitely need to get an, uh, a, a, a Strider back in my collection. So I'm saying it right here, right now. If anyone out there, uh, any of you guys has a uh, a Strider that you're interested in in unloading, let me know. I I, I might be in the market for it. Uh, let's see, James, it's only one case, not a series, only a single antidote could be an outlier. Yeah, that that's the thing we all have to remember. Like, even with the gentleman who commented on my video saying that his MXG gear um, broke, I'm not sure, I can't remember if he said multiple uh, clips broke, um, but, uh, you know, it could be just an isolated incident and he was hacked and he's like, Damn, fuck this. Uh, the MXG clips didn't, keep a good finish i i tend to disagree sir you know what though you know what you could be right and you're probably right because i i have a lot of knives and i don't carry them all too frequently which is kind of part of why i want to sell some off and get some new knives but that's another story and that's a story i've <laughs> i've talked about a lot biggest problem with me with lynch never available yeah yeah it's like you have to be waiting by the phone, waiting by the, waiting by the computer for Lynch to drop. Well, that's good. It's good to have a product that is in demand and, uh, you know, that, you know, people are going to jump all over. So that about does it for this edition of Thursday Night Knives. Um, I want to thank Bob for coming on the show and debating me. <laughs> what a handsome gentleman and charming too. Uh, thanks for joining me <laughs> tonight and tu and tuning in and, and commenting. I really appreciate it. If you haven't yet, please like, subscribe. You've already commented, and I really appreciate that because that's what makes this fun. And, well, that's one of the aspects that makes this fun. And uh, also, forward this, pass it along to a friend if you think someone might be interested in it. Um, and then that way in the future, we can get more voices in here and we can have more discussion. Thank you, Doug. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. You're awesome. Um, anyway, uh, I'd like to say a big thanks. And all of those, uh, thank you, sir. I appreciate it. Um, all of those things, like, comment, subscribe, all that, they help in a, in a very big way. So please, please do that. And uh, I'd like to say that for myself and for Jim behind the switcher, um, I'm Bob DeMarco saying, well, I'm Bob the Knife Junkie. DeMarco saying, don't take dull for an answer.